Okay, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 35, and the Lord's word says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, can you make me clean? Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your, cle- for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet, the people still came to him from everywhere. See you. Um, We need the Lord's help. So let's bow our heads and pray first of all. Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for being a God who speaks to reveal truth to us. And we pray, our Father, that you would help us um, as we uh, come to see Jesus' priorities today. We pray, Father, that you will help us to see Jesus. We pray that you would help us to see um, why he's come. We pray that you would help us to understand uh, his priorities and see how that has a bearing on our lives. Um, Help us to worship, we pray. When we see Jesus, we'll worship him. So help us, we pray, in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I don't know, have we got any Faulty Towers fans in the house? Oh, there's a few. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a Faulty Towers fan. I think they're fantastic. I can't believe that there's only 12 episodes. I mean, um, you, you, so such a fantastic uh, comedy series. Um, it's hard to believe that there's just 12. If you're a fan, you'll probably be able to answer um, the or, or fill in the blanks on the titles of some of these Faulty Towers uh, episodes. Um, so h- see how you get on. The Hotel Blank. The Hotel. I heard it down here, Inspector. Yeah, the Hotel Inspector. The Kipper and the Blank. The Keeper and the Corpse, yes. Uh, Something Salad. Yeah, Waldorf Salad, that's a classic one, isn't it? Um, And this one's a harder one. A Touch of Blank. A Touch of... The the very first episode, actually. Touch of Class. Touch of Class. Okay. Um, You you said the corpse, didn't you, Nate? The the, the kipper and the corpse. Well, in that episode, one of the guests dies um, during the night. Um, If you're a hotel owner, um, dead guests is not good for the reputation. Basil Fawlty says Egon Rone would knock off a star for that. Um, And so in an attempt to conceal the truth, the body of the dead guest, whose name is... Come on, you faulty towers watchers. Mr. Lehman, um, sounds a little bit like linen, um, ends up being stored temporarily in the hotel's linen basket. Um, some of you look a little, a little bit horrified. It's okay, it's a comedy. Okay, it was before the watershed. Um, it's okay. Um, and then when the next morning his friends come to pick him up, uh, not knowing what had happened to him, uh, and they ask for Mr. Lehman. We've come to pick up Mr. Lehman. Faulty, uh, Basil Faulty thinks that, uh, that they're from the undertakers and that they've come to take the body away. Um, so when they say, where is Mr. Lehman? He says, pointing to the linen basket, he's in there. Um, and, and the comedy works because they're talking at cross purposes. Um, Basil thinks he knows why they've come 
Um, but obviously he's completely mistaken. Um, they haven't come for that reason at all. And that, that's what carries the sketch and, you know, we all laugh and, and the rest of it. They are great comedies, aren't they? Um, our bit of the Bible today deals with the question, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? And unless we get that right, we'll end up at cross purposes. Why did Jesus come? Has he come to show us uh, how to be a good person so that God will be pleased with us? Or has he come as a problem fixer? Um, In the little bit from last week, immediately before this bit here, Jesus seems to be a great problem fixer. People are coming to Jesus with various diseases and and he's healing them and casting out demons. So is that why Jesus has come, to put right the stuff that's wrong in our lives, to heal sickness, to show us how to have successful marriages or careers, or to show us how to to help us to make our kids grow up um, as respectable citizens as though though we could, um, with good jobs, or how to free us from things which haunt us, um, many addictions and so on. The kind of Jesus as the one to give us a leg up and to prosper our plans. These are all sorts of ideas as to why Jesus came. But why did Jesus come? It's an important question, isn't it? And, you know, only three times in Mark's gospel, we hear the answer to that from Jesus' own lips. From Jesus' own lips. That's got to be important, hasn't it? And one of those occasions is right here in this little bit of the Bible in verse 38, Jesus speaking says, that's why I've come. That's why I've come. Um, But if we just dive in there, we'd be jumping ahead. So we've got to begin where Mark does. He begins in verse 35. Now, I hope you're still awake. Just to check if you're still awake. um, In the little bit of the Bible that we've had today, how many miracles, how many miracles are there? Um, What's the miracle? What's the, what's the miracle in the bit that we've had read? Healing the, healing the man with leprosy, of course, yeah. Correct, correct, unless you're a teenager. Unless you're a teenager. And then there are two miracles today, and the first one is in sentence 35. Have a look. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up. And you're like, <laughs> very early in the morning, and he got up, they don't belong in the same sentence. Yeah, right? Well, you mean to say that there are two five o'clocks in a day? Get out of here. Um, you know, f- for some of us, this is on a par with the feeding of the 5,000, isn't it? You know, you're feeling a little bit woozy. Do, do you need an, an aspirin? Dan, do you need an aspirin? Ben, do you need an aspirin? Okay, you're okay. Hang on in there, okay? Um, well, let's keep going. Let's keep going. In all seriousness... In all seriousness, what's going on here in this little bit is a moment of great crisis on which all of history hangs. Look what it says. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And you're thinking, right, well, where's the crisis in that? Of course, Jesus prayed. Um, That's what you'd expect Jesus to be doing right, is the way we think. But if we ask, why is Jesus praying, then we'll see three things that Mark doesn't want us to miss. If we ask, why is Jesus praying? Three things. First of all, number one, immediately before we're told that he's praying. Again, look what happened the night before. You know, the little headings that we have in our Bibles aren't always helpful. Mine here says Jesus um, prays uh, in a solitary place. And it's not always very helpful. If you, you, if you, you should have your Bible still open in front of you, it'll be helpful. You need to just imagine that not there. And imagine our first sentence reading straight out of the previous one. And we see that the night before, Jesus had healed many with various diseases, as we said, and cast out many demons. And what a night that must have been. What an amazing night that must have been. Secondly, Mark records three occasions where Jesus prays. Um, And on all three occasions, it's when his mission is under threat. 
Now, the most ex obvious example of that that some of you will know is uh, Mark records for us Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and that's a, that's a moment of great um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, pressure to his mission at that particular time. Um, he prays, Father, take this cup away from me, yeah. but not, not my will, but your will be done. Um, so there are occasions, Jesus is recorded in Mark as praying, in occasions when his mission is under, th under great threat. And thirdly, um, that word solitary place that Mark uses here, uh, he says he went off to a solitary place, which we know means, you know, he went off, Jesus went off to pray in a quiet place, um, but it's also actually the same word that's translated wilderness or desert in verses 12 and 13. And I know some of you have been here with us over these few weeks, and you know that when it appeared there, it was a place of danger. It was a place where Jesus kind of goes into battle with Satan, as it were. So if you put all those three things together, uh, what we see here is Jesus is praying in a moment of crisis, or of threat to his mission, a moment of testing and great temptation. And so he seeks direction from his heavenly father in prayer as to his mission, why he came. Um, his father's given him great power to heal people and to cast out demons, great power to fix people's, you know, very real but temporary problems. And that would have made him hugely hugely popular i mean just think for a moment what it would have been like to be in jesus's shoes this is surely popularity on a unprecedented scale just imagine what it was like if word got out that there was someone in liverpool okay just think it was someone in liverpool who was completely healing people of various sicknesses just with a word just imagine that imagine how how the, the hospitals would be emptying out wouldn't they um, for this. Imagine what the roads would be like in the whole of Merseyside and then as the news spread across the whole of the country if someone could do this. If you had that kind of power you could be the most popular person in the whole world. <laughs> if you want followers Jesus what, what's going to guarantee you followers? You could have anything you wanted you could command the highest price. You would be the richest person in the whole world if you could do this. The richest person on the planet. And let's face it, too, it's not a bad, they're not bad things that Jesus is doing. They're good things. Look at the smiles on parents' faces when the, the, the little child with whatever it might be, leukemia or something, is healed in an instant. If God has given you this power, Jesus, surely that's how he wants you to use it. Do you see this moment of great crisis? And in verses 36 and 37, we can see why he didn't call a kind of the family meeting together to, to ask for his followers to give him advice in the midst of this crisis. Look what it says there in verse 36. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. I don't think it takes much imagination to imagine what Simon and his companions were thinking what are you doing here, Jesus? We've been searching for you. Everyone's here for more of, of what we had going on last night. Word's spreading quickly, and there's, there's already hundreds of people here wanting you to heal them. And it's, it's, it's worth noticing, isn't it? Here, right at the beginning of Mark, we're going to see something we, we, that comes up again and again in, this, in Mark's Gospel, that even those who are closest to Jesus fail to grasp who he is and why he came. So in this real crisis, Jesus prays to know his Father's will. And we get to hear from Jesus' own lips in the midst of that crisis why he came. Verse 38, let me read it. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus prioritizes preaching. And we might ask, what's the preaching that he prioritizes? Mark's told us in verse 15, the time has come 
The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. For Jesus, how we respond to that command is more important than what we want him to do for us. So why aren't churches full on Sundays? What makes it difficult for us to reach out to people on our estate? People don't want a preacher, Jesus, who comes with authority, issuing commands. They want a Jesus who will fix up their problems. And you know, what's going to make a difference? We preach and we proclaim. You know, like that, like we're, we're emphasizing our totalizer at the moment, isn't it? Why do we see so many people join our church for a little bit of time and then wander off and we don't see them again because they want a Jesus who will fix it, a Mr. Mr. Fix-It Jesus who will help them to fulfill their goals, a kind of personal trainer, as it were, for life. But Jesus won't be that. And when that realization dawns, they go somewhere else, often with bitterness. Listen, isn't it a good job that there's something that matters more than the problems that occupy you and that you may have brought in here this morning? Isn't it, isn't it a really good job that there's something that matters more than that according to one with great authority, Jesus Christ? Yet some of you, I know, are battling with really hard things in this life. And even beyond these walls, plenty of people are walking today in the valley of the shadow of death. And they know that, but for a miracle, they are not going to get better. Things are not going to get better. Those things that, that, that really matter to them. Jesus comes as an eternal king of an eternal kingdom. And we may think our problem is a big problem is here and is in the here and now. And let's face it, if you've got a loved one who is terminally sick, that is a very, very big and present problem. But Jesus won't let us settle for half measures. He's come to make us safe for eternity. You can heal a sick person, but they're still going to die again one day. And the fact is, Jesus knows your and my real need better than we do. And in a moment of crisis, he chose the hard path for my sake and for your sake. And Jesus' resolute priority makes me ask, what am I prioritizing? Um, how easy is it for things of eternal significance in my life to get drowned out by just by the everyday, by the work, by, by the toys, by the many calls on my time, responsibilities, family responsibilities, just getting through another day? I wonder what would a small degree change look like that moved your priority in line with what Jesus so obviously thinks is so important? What would that look like in your life? A small degree change that moved you in that direction? What is it that seems at the moment so important for you and me that would really shrivel to nothing if we took to heart Jesus' priority? So let's carry on. Healing is not the priority, is what he said. Preaching the gospel uh, of God is. So, um, so what do we get next? Jesus heals a leper. And we ought to be thinking, did I, did I just read that right? I thought you just said his priority isn't healing, and then straight after we get him healing a leper. Why, why is that? It seems that he just can't help himself. Jesus just can't help himself. Verse 40, look what it says. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And we need to feel the desperation of this poor leper. Do we know much about leprosy? Any of us know very much about leprosy? Just grab water. You're all looking at me blank. 
for the benefit of the recording, that silence you hear is because um, I'm actually in a room speaking to a room full of consultant surgeons specialising in skin diseases, uh, but we're in church, um, so they're not, people don't give anything away in church, okay? Do we know anything about um, leprosy? Well, leprosy is a horribly disfiguring skin disease. Um, sufferers experienced deformities of the nose and the eyes and the ears and the fingers and hands and arms and legs, not because leprosy is a rotting infection as it's um, usually thought, but because the disease acts as a kind of an anesthetic it has a kind of a numbing effect. Um, so those, the disfigurement that, that you get with leprosy comes as a result of not having the body's usual pain warning system, early warning system, as it were. And you'd be amazed how important it is that you in your body have this sort of early warning pain uh, system because it, it stops you, for example, accidentally reaching into a fire to pick something out and not actually feeling it. Or it stops you washing your face with scalding water. Um, and it stops you from holding something so tight, gripping it so tight, or kicking something which you hadn't ought to kick so that you just don't notice and you end up breaking a bone. Um, well, that's how, how it normally works, but not obviously for someone with leprosy. And you just imagine that happening, um, you can see how you quickly end up with a body with um, open sores, which then get infections and rot, and so you lose a nose, lips, fingers, eyes, arms, legs, and so on. Poor souls. Poor, poor souls. And then on top of that, there's the isolation. Um, You'd, you'd be literally be cut off from society because it was thought at that time that leprosy was highly contagious, which it is not. Um, and if a leper went into a house, then that house was thought to be polluted. Um, if a leper walked under a tree, then that tree was polluted for anyone who passed under it themselves after. Um, in Israel, the life of a poor leper was summed up in the Bible book of Leviticus, chapter 13, where we read this. The person with an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Just pause and think for a moment. What would that be like to have your son um, or your daughter or loved one or, or you yourself have this disease? If it was a, a child of yours, to have them taken away from you and to know that for their life they face the prospect of progressive disfigurement and social isolation so that in fact that they would have to always stand at least 50 paces away from anybody else imagine where 50 paces would take you now in the direction you're facing and me imagine 50 paces away that's the distance you would be from from another person who was well never a hug never a kiss again That's what's going on when we read verse 40. So let's just do it again, because we probably didn't realize. We just skipped over it. Verse 40. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Actually, it's against the rules for the leper to come to Jesus like this. We've just said but he does anyway. And notice that he doesn't doubt Jesus' ability to heal him. His question is, is Jesus willing? Is he willing? Verse 41 says, Jesus was filled with compassion. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. And last week, do you remember Jesus took Simon's mother-in-law 
by the hand, put her hand in his hand, and lifted her up. There, there are actually eight recorded touches of Jesus in Mark's gospel. But, but, but just think about this for a minute. In all of them, there was no need for Jesus to touch anybody. He didn't have to touch any of them because you just heal with a word. But he did. He thought about why he did. He did it because he was delighted to. He was delighted to touch them in their need. And what a wonderful and great touch it must have been. Yeah, probably the, the leper hadn't been touched by a soft, healthy hand for years. If he had a wife, he hadn't known her touch, much less her hug for years. Or a hug or a kiss from his children if he had them. Why did Jesus touch him? He wanted the leper to feel his willingness. To feel it and his sympathy. That touch, can you imagine it? It must have been absolutely sublime for that leper. That touch said to him, I'm with you. I understand. I love you. And then reading on verse 42, we're told, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. And isn't that great? Isn't that great? Having read what we've just read, isn't that wonderful? And you know, it says the same thing three times. It's three times great. It says immediately. It was immediate. Skin and body parts that hadn't been there were there. That this isn't just a case of um, restoration. This is recreation from Jesus here, isn't it? He says the leprosy left him. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Gone. No trace. Left him. No living under the shadow of a relapse. And to top it off, we read, and he was cured. In case you hadn't realized, he says, Mark says, immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. Fantastic, isn't it? What a fantastic, immediate, permanent cure we see there. And then verse 43, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anybody. Because if he does, of course, people will want the Mr. Fix-It Jesus. And we know what his priority is. We've been told what his priority is. So Jesus says, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. So why does Jesus prioritize preaching over healing, first of all, and then we have this miracle here, which is about healing. Why? What's going on? Well, number one, we've seen, we must have seen, haven't we, that there's a sense in which Jesus just can't help it. And that's good. We should see that. He just can't help it. This is Jesus. Here's a look into the heart of the healer. Here is Jesus, and he just can't help it. It expresses his very heart. Do you, do you know Jesus like that? Do you know that's what he's like? Love for the unlovely like that? That's Jesus' heart. But I want to uh, suggest you that something else is going on. Um, because what does the leper actually come to Jesus and ask him to do in verse 40? Just have a look down again and see what does he actually ask him to do. He doesn't say heal me. He says make me clean. Yeah, clean. What's, what's that all about? What's going on? Um, it doesn't mean that he was dirty and he needed Jesus to clean him in that way. The Bible word unclean means something awful really it means cut off from God the leper knows that he's cut off from God as it were leprosy had come to be regarded as a punishment from God which only God could put right so there was more going on that day Jesus wasn't just healing the man he was saying to him I love you and I'm going to make you clean so that you're no longer cut off from God's 
And as we go through Mark's gospel, we're going to discover that the sickness that we all need to be healed of, which cuts us off from God, is sin. And you and I will probably never bump into anybody or encounter anybody with leprosy. But the spiritual reality for all of us is that we are all spiritual lepers, every single one of us. And if ever there was a disease which was a good picture of sin, well, leprosy was surely it. So like, like, like leprosy, sin comes from within and, ex- and shows itself on the outside. Like leprosy, it progresses uh, steadily and relentlessly. Like leprosy, sin is dehumanizing. Like leprosy, it, it results in a loss of feeling. Like leprosy, it ultimately ruins and destroys. So we should think of that and then run the story of the leper back. But this time, thinking of your sin and my sin. What if the leper in this story was a picture of you and of me? Would you, would you come to him, begging him on his knees on your knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can make me clean. And what would Jesus do as you did that? Rewind the story. Rewind the story. Filled with compassion, he would reach out his hand and touch you. I am willing. Be clean. And touched your sinfulness. Touched your sinfulness is what he's done reached out his hand to you is what he's done at the cross as he stretched out his arms swap places with you is what he's done um and that's what must surely have dawned on simon peter when he replayed the detail of the story simon peter is the one whose uh, eyewitness account mark is writing down here and he must surely when he replayed this story have have, have come to the realization that that's actually exactly what happened here. Um, the leper swapped places with Jesus. Jesus swapped places with the leper. Look what it says in the last sentence. Because the leper didn't do what Jesus told him to do. He went out and told everybody, and who can blame him? Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And then we get that little detail. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places yet the people still came to him from everywhere you see how the story began with jesus on the inside and the leper is on the outside and it ends with jesus outside in lonely places jesus and the leper have traded places replay the story and we think about our sin and the complete the, the complete cure of the leper which was, which was immediate and permanent. Well, we replay that when we think about our sin. Jesus is willing to do that with your sin. Jesus does do that with our sin, your sin and my sin. Complete, immediate, permanent, as we put our faith and trust in him. Well, let me finish by encouraging you to take a big step back from these two stories. Just to return to that question we began with, why did Jesus come? Um, And I want you really to notice that both of those stories contribute to an answer to that, okay? Which is odd because on the face of it, they they don't belong together. They crush up against one another, strangely. In the first, Jesus, as as we saw, said, my priority is preaching over healing. And then immediately next, we find him doing this, this healing. But actually, the reality is that Mark forces both of those stories together. And I'm so glad he does, because they do belong together. And you can't answer the question, why did Jesus come, without both of those parts of the story and understanding both of them. So let me just quickly try and apply that in a way which joins those two together for some of us. And say this, perhaps there's something in your life at the moment that seems to be all-absorbing, some some. Out, something on the outside, some present felt need that is all absorbing. And you want Jesus to fix that. And let me say to you, you don't, you don't need Jesus to fix that. You need 
Christ himself. In this life, we will have trouble. And if one problem is fixed, there's another one waiting around the corner. Kick one habit and your heart will pop up and grab something else and run with that without Christ. What you and I need is the touch of the Saviour that we've seen here. You and I need him to cleanse, to cleanse you. If he cleanses you, the outside stuff will be healed. It may take time, but the healing of the leper is proof that Jesus Christ has the power and the willingness to do it. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't offer you a Jesus this morning to fix up your problems. And if that sounds cold on my lips, it's because you need to look to Jesus. Look at that story of Jesus healing the leper. There's absolutely no coldness there whatsoever. Just white hot heat love for people in need. And he says, I'm with you. I understand. I love you. I've come to deal with your problem from the inside out. And so he says, will you repent and believe? Will you repent and believe? What does that look like? It's turn to Jesus. Isn't he beautiful? Haven't you seen how beautiful he is here? Turn to him. And you will find that as you turn to this wonderful saviour with his power and his incredible heart, you turn away from the sin. As you turn and believe in him. Jesus wants you to know the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. That's what he wants us to know, isn't it? Well, I'm going to finish there. A lot for us to think about. I think we're going to sing before we have communion. Is that right? So while the musicians take their